come across a fascinating column by the left-wing kook columnist Ruth Marcus. And the title of her column in the Washington Compost is Obama's Where's Waldo Presidency? Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here's her take. For a man who won office talking about change, we can believe in Barack Obama can be a strangely passive president. There are a startling number of occasions in which the president has been missing in action. Unwilling, reluctant, or late to weigh in on the issue of the moment. He is too often more reactive than inspirational, more cautious than forceful. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That sounds like me. He didn't want to get mired in legislative details during the health care debate for fear of repeating the Clinton administration's prescriptive take ours or leave it approach. Doesn't want to go first on proposing entitlement reform because history teaches this is not the best route to a deal. He didn't want to say anything too tough about Libya for fear of endangering Americans trapped there. He didn't want to weigh in on the labor battle in Wisconsin because, well, it's a swing state, yet the dots connect to form an unsettling portrait of a Where's Waldo presidency. You frequently have to squint to find the White House amid the larger landscape. She goes on. This tough assessment from someone who generally shares the president's ideological perspective may be hard to square with the conservative portrait of Obama as the rapacious perpetrator of a big government agenda. The president's being simultaneously accused of overarching ambition and gutless fight-ducking. Maybe he's doing something right. Maybe or else Obama has at times managed to do both simultaneously. Gee, that sounds like what I said. On health care, for instance, he took on a big fight without being able to articulate a clear message or being willing to set out any but the broadest policy prescriptions. Lawmakers, not to mention the public, were left guessing about what exactly the administration wanted to see in the measure and where it would draw red lines. That was no isolated case. Where, for example, is the president on the verge of a potential government shutdown? If not this week, then a few weeks from now. She goes on. What a brilliant column. Oh, my God. So cutting edge. So deep. You know, what's interesting is this. I guess like mine's, although my mind isn't anything like hers or hers like mine. She's a lib. What's interesting is this. And it's true. The written word... The written word has more lasting power than the spoken word. I know that seems odd, but it's true. I talked about this last night, right out of the box, at the top of the first hour of my program. Where is this guy? Got all these issues going on. Yes, he's he's transforming America by delegating, and all these big bills come to him, and he son, but he's not actually involved in the particulars. Well, you heard it. We went down the list, and by the way, it's not the first time. Then this hotbed comes out. Excuse me, column in the Washington Post. Brilliant! Oh my God, it's so brilliant! No, it's not. It's so blasé because it was said the next day. It was written the next day. It was said the day before. Just wanted to point that out. Our Justice Department, as you know, is extremely political and partisan. And our Attorney General is looking out for his people. Not all the people, his people. This is a remarkable comment, which we'll get to later. You've probably heard it played a thousand times before, but you haven't heard me, the expert on the subject, discuss it yet. 